The Cameroon Dragonfly Project commenced in 1995 and lasted through until 2003, with almost continuous field work in the forests, the rainforests of southwest Cameroon. This is re re unique research and it will probably never be repeated and certainly not in Cameroon. So let's get started. This talk is presented in, as you can see from the screen, seven different sections. Uh, this first video is relating only to the first four sections that you can see in the red block there. These three remaining sections are living and traveling and the fauna of the forest can be found in the second video in this series. So, ladies and gentlemen, Cameroon, why and where? Well, let's first of all look at the African continent. Of all continents which contain tropical habitats, Africa, with only around 800 known species of dragonfly, has probably got the poorest fauna. It's also arguably one of the poorest studied regions for dragonflies. Here on this map, we go into a little bit more detail. The red rectangle is where Cameroon is situated. And you will see that yellow circle. That is where we basically studied. Now, this area, the yellow area, is part of the Bight of Biafra, the armpit of Africa, the wettest part of the African continent, where rainfall, in fact, in one of the towns that we visited, we went to a marsh quite regularly near this town, it has in excess of 10 metres of rain per year, the second wettest part in the world. This warm, wet region supports some of the greatest biodiversity on the continent. So going a bit further still, we're now into Cameroon itself. You can see there it's a very varied country, rainforest deep in the south, where we visited here around southwest Cameroon. Uh, where the red rectangle shows. Uh, but if you go to the north, you go through savannah, right through into desert, right through as far as Lake, Lake Chad. Once again, the area we visited was in the red triangle, in the red rectangle. But why? There. This map here shows the upland areas that we studied. Uh, why uplands, you may ask? Well, there's a myth about African rainforest. Most of the rainforests of Africa are less than 2,000 years old. Uh, there's a myth, basically, that these forests have been there for millennia upon millennia, and it's quite untrue. The forest, thanks to climate change, has expanded and contracted many times. And when the forest contracts, what is left are the upland refuges. From where future species and the forest itself expands when the climate becomes more um, suitable. These, of course, therefore remain areas of endemism and biodiversity and provide some of the most interesting areas for the bio biologist to study. Now, way back, um, the key feet in the, in the 20th century, the key people who studied the dragonflies of Africa were Elliot Penny, who worked mainly in the south, and Robert Gambles, who was based in Nigeria. Now, Graham Vick had the good fortune to live quite close to Robert Gambles towards the end of his life. And Gambles always said that he, if you ever get the chance, Graham, you should try and visit Cameroon. It's the holy grail for dragonfly studies. Uh, Graham tried for over many years, right through the 1980s. And then in the 1990s, he got his opportunity and the CDP was formed. So there we have the situation. As I say, Graham and Mary Vick visited in 1995, had a great trip, made lots of contacts. But Mary decided that in 1996, she wasn't going to go back. So Graham contacted me and that it was it. We formed the Cameroon Dragonfly Project. And that is a photograph of the first four of us who went in summer of 1996, the first CDP visit. 
Chelmick on the end, Vic next, Don Tag, who many of you will know, and Pete Mitchell, who became our recorder. And if you want more information about the CDP, its formation, its trips, where we went, what we did in a light-hearted manner, then I suggest you get hold of a copy of Agrion, which is the newsletter of the Worldwide Dragonfly Association, and you will find more there of interest. If you can't get a copy, just get in touch with me. So there we are, folks, just a very brief uh, look at where we went in the, the region. We flew on each trip to Douala, which is not the capital of Cameroon, but probably the biggest city. We then went on to Limbe, which was our basis, which was this, the former capital of southwest Cameroon in the, the Anglophone district. And that gave us a basis for studying around the base of Little Mount Cameroon. And finally, we landed up at Nyasso, which is a small village on the base of Mount Coupe, which provided the base for all our work in the uplands around that area. Um, we, in 1998, attempted to travel from Nyasso right through to Takamanda, which was the site where Jackie Groves, who was doing research on lowland gorillas in the area, was providing lots of records. Unfortunately, we failed in that attempt. Uh, it was only a distance of about 130 kilometers, but we couldn't make it due to the terrible road conditions. That story and others relating to traveling in Cameroon will appear on the second video. Okay, folks, this next section outlines some of the field work that we did and the habitats visited. Now, this first photo is a picture of Don Tag on our 1996 trip, looking up to the slopes, those lovely primary forest slopes on Mount Coupe, with a picture of the local secondary school, which is no longer in existence. Um, Fieldwork on Coupe, Mount Coupe, was no problem at all because the Mount Coupe Forest Project, which at one time was financed by BirdLife International, I think later, more latterly by the World Wildlife Fund, uh, gave us all the permissions, the permits for collecting, etc., etc. But that was not the case everywhere. But once away from Mount Coupe, it was absolutely essential to get the permission of the local chief. Um, on our first trip out in 1996, typical enthusiasm, we dashed out of the van, having found a nice stretch of stream. In we went, collecting. But Otto, our local man, who I'll come to in a moment, he was very concerned about what we were doing. And we were eventually quite, he was proved right. We were dragged out of the stream and taken down to the chief's, the chief's palace. Um, there we sat around the chiefs and discussed various matters. We, we, we threw the cola nuts. If I had time, I'd tell you more. Uh, but fortunately, the wheels were oiled by the fact that we had a nice bottle of scotch to hand over to the chief. And all was well. And out we were allowed to go back in the field. In fact, I don't know whether any of you have read books by Gerard Durrell, um, where not really very PC books now because they deal with the collecting of animals for zoos. The one dealing with Cameroon was the Baffert Beagles. And you get the very distinct impression that Gerald Durrell himself spent most of the time sitting drinking scotch with the with the chief uh, and letting his, 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 his people assistants out there collecting the animals. So let's have a look at some of the habitats. This is one of the few large streams or low rivers that flows around Mount Coupe. Now this was an atypical habitat. It's quite a large stream, as you can see, but it, I'm showing it because it was a particularly good area for Eastnid, orca dragonflies. Um, one particular example was and you can see, the folks, that I, as you know, I'm a larval man to my 
roots and you're likely to see more larvae than you are adults in this uh, presentation. However, this is the larvae of Afroecina scotius. Uh, the first record in actual fact for this in Cameroon as the adult was found by Mary Vick caught on the first Cameroon trip in 1995. However, in this stream, the larvae are absolutely abundant. Absolutely everywhere we found all stages of, of existence. Now, another beast we found on this stream is this baby, Anax congoli. This is not really so much as a, a smaller stream species, much more edge of forest. But this is a huge Anax and found reasonably commonly around Mount Cameroon. And more interestingly, these are the exuviae. Now, if you go from the left, uh, we have Hemianax epipidia, which is the one that we now get reasonably commonly in Europe, the small one. Then we go to our own Anax imperator, another similar Anax, Anax cornreus, but then we come to Anax congoliath, huge beast that it is, similar in size to the much more common, much more widespread Anax tristis. Now let's look at the real interest of the habitats. Now this is a typical stream flowing away from Mount Coupe, tiny forest stream. Now I live here in the Weald in Sussex, uh, where we have many streams that look similar to this, far too dark for dragonflies. But when you're in the tropics, and particularly in this part of Cameroon, this is where the great interest for dragonflies lies. There's another example, the fast flowing stream at the back, which perhaps you can see. And there's a little seepage flowing through. And there's two of the lads, Otto, who I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, and Dora, who this is in our 1998 trip, rifling through a seepage, which is also another very important habitat. And I can't leave the presentation without a view of our, of our leader, Mr. Graham Vick, in all his finery at a waterfall in the middle of the forest of Mount Coupe. And it was here that he and I found the larvae of what we think, we didn't ever breed it out, but what we think was Stenocnemis pachystigma, which was a small damselfly actually clinging to the vegetation and breeding in the waterfall, which was a first for Africa. There it is, Stenocnemis pachystigma found in the waterfall. Now, I must mention a word about Otto. Now, that's Otto Mazumbi, who was a local farmer who Graham befriended in 1995. And he proved to be quite adept at studying the damsel, the dragonflies and damselflies. And he was employed by the CDP for a period from 1995 right through to 2003, collecting, identifying and doing larval work. Um, He's uh, now, in fact, he's left Cameroon. He now works in California with his family. So I think the CDP gave him a real foot up the ladder. Anyway, the vital part of our work, as well as just collecting in the forest, was associating larvae with adults, hence the breeding system. That was the first steps. But look, eventually, back in, up in the early 2000s, we had our own breeding center. And we've even got a picture here of an emerged insect, which I think is a Philomachromia. Uh, the problem with it, well, I'd love to say it was hugely successful. It wasn't really. We bred quite a lot out, um, but sometimes we separated the adults from the larvae, which means we, we years later had trouble associating what they are. It was, a, it was a, a, what could have been a real great part of success that wasn't too much so. So what? did we find? Well, let's first of all um, put a few markers down. Um, Graham was responsible for the adults, Graham Vick, and as you can imagine, I dealt with the larvae. And I do apologise if there's more larvae in this talk than there is adults, because that's the way I'm doing the talk. Anyway, let's consider the first problem. Identification. How do you identify it? Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that you're in an area where there are no keys, there are no books, 
You've got no lovely Dijkstra for identifying your European material. You've got no Steve Cam. You've got no Brochard for your larvae. Nothing. All you've got is some museum specimens and some papers. So Graham decided that what he needed to do before he went uh, in 1995, he produced a key to the dragonflies of Cameroon, a guide. It covered all known adult male insects, and it was based on published papers, museum specimens, etc., etc. And this would allow Graham, instead of willy-nilly collecting everything in the field, he would be able to identify the common stuff and only collect responsibly what was unknown. Uh, the other thing is we had the advantage of having Otto, who I described earlier, and there's Otto and Graham together, and Otto is holding a specimen, you might just be able to see it there, of a thing called Uma Mizumbi. In other words, an Uma damselfly that was named after Otto. Graham basically collected all the, all the adult records and also including Otto's material. And that then all put into an Excel spreadsheet by my good friend, Pete Mitchell. Uh, he put combined all the records from all the trips into one Excel spreadsheet, and that has provided the basis for all our records. The larval problem was even worse. If you can imagine, the knowledge base for adults was bad. Well, for larvae, it was virtually non-existent. There were, again, a few papers, um, but it was decided that really the only approach we could take for larvae was to collect everything. We had to collect all the material. There's no other way of getting around it. Uh, we collected it and Otto collected. Uh, we also had teams of people when we were out there also collecting, working in the fields. We then basically, when I got back into the UK in 90, I think it was late 90s after the second trip, I produced a key, which I rather pompously called the Dragonflies of Central Africa, which it wasn't, of course, it was just Cameroon. Um, and that was then based upon, again, the same way as Graham, based upon the larval material that we got, published papers, etc. Then during lockdown, I revised and updated the entire database uh, and added these into Pete Mitchell's database, giving us an overall picture of dragonflies for that southwest Cameroon. So what we found, um, Anisoptera dragonflies, we had 680 adult records, 380 larval records. So larvae was quite successful. 55% of the adult records were larvae, which was pretty, pretty good, pretty good as for Zygoptera, more adult records, which again you'd expect because Zygoptera are easier to collect, and only 107 larval records. 13% of adult for, for larvae, mainly because Zygoptera are harder to collect. They're smaller, more difficult to see. More importantly, we increased the records for the camp for whole of Cameroon by more than 300%, and we added larval records. Previously in Cameroon, there had been none. So, what did we find? Well, this is an analysis of the adults. 66% were all libellulids, which are hawk, um, darters, skimmers, etc. Uh, which is what you'd expect. If you were in Europe and you went out and you analysed your records in Europe, I suspect you would find a similar situation. 66% would be them. But look what happens when you come to the larvae. Libellulae, much smaller, only 23%. Gonfidae, club tails, 47%. LIS, by the way, cordialids, emerald dragonflies. 23% um, of larvae were emerald dragonflies. Um, certainly seems to be the case that the larvae presented a much different picture of the situation compared to the adults. Let's look at the top 10 genera, in which case. The top 10 genera for adults, there they are. They start with the most common, which was Orthetrum. Now, again, if you're in Europe, I expect Orthetrum would be a pretty common genera. Orthetrums in, are very common throughout Europe. They're common throughout Africa, very much so. 
but the second most common was philomachromia. Now, philomachromia is very closely related to our own machromia, which we find in Southern Europe, which I have spent at least 20 years of my life studying. And philomachromia is very similar. But look, you would never say that would ever happen in Europe. But when you come to the larvae, it's even more interesting because philomachromia is the most common larvae found. The second most common was, an, was a gomphid, paragomphus. Most, second most common larvae found. The third most common was caught, but we'll come to that later. Let's look at philomachromia, the most dominant dragonfly of the rainforests of Mount Coupe. And in fact, most of the rainforests around that area dominated by philomachromia. This fantastic drag, 21% of all larvae and 10% of all the adults. Now, the way you first come across them and you see how common they are, is when we first arrived and the first or second day we were on Mount Coupe, you get your riddle your, or, your, or your sieve in the little sandy streams. And there they are. And the whole stream is full of these little larvae and they move you literally put your you put your net in to collect and then you see them move and there you see this attitude here they move they suddenly they move and their legs swept back like this and they settle down again and once they settle down you lose them all you see all this all this above the sound is perhaps the wing cases the two eyes the nose knob the mask is buried so if you like that's a praise eye view of philomachromia in the rainforest these are the adults, but quite, sim quite simple to identify. The Philomachromia eneothorax was the one commonest on Coupe, but most local, with lovely green eyes, and Macromia, Philomachromia canari with these, these uh, yellowish eyes. Both of the species were bred out by the CDP, and just to show you, there is Chelmix resplendent breeding out of Philomachromia canari in his shed back home. Gonfidae, as I mentioned, are the most dominant family. Look at the situation when it comes to the top 10 genera. Um, Paragonphus was right down the end in terms of adults, as an adult, as uh, in terms of adults, but on the larval front, look, five genera of, of gomphids were found in Cameroon, in, in the rainforests of Cameroon. So by far and away, the commonest family were anis, were uh, called um, gomphidae. Um, but look in a bit more detail. There is the most common dragonfly. And this is, you could argue, the most common dragonfly club tail dragonfly throughout Africa. This is Paragonphus genii, the one you get in Southern Europe and North Africa and throughout much of Africa. There are 30 other species in Africa, which is the most abundant genus. Um, but let's look at the adult. The, adult the, the, the adults are very attractive, but the larvae are quite unique, very easy to identify. They are rather bullet-like, as you can see there, and they have this odd bent back fourth segment of the abdomen which is quite diagnostic and quite unique but as well as this bullet like profile but when it came to lockdown and i decided to redo the whole of my database i started finding another this one the mystery larva yeah it's again it's a little it's a bullet like profile certainly but it's got a strange head the antennae are wrong, and the labial palps, instead of being lovely and smooth, have got these crenations across them. And I, for a long time, was calling this Paro Um And after much discussion and sending it to Frank Suling and other experts on African dragonflies, including K.D. Dijkstra, um, we eventually came to the conclusion with other material that was known to be identified, this is a species called Cornigomphus the second most common gomphid on the rainforest, the third most common dra dragonfly as larvae on the rainforest. 
So what of Corny Gomphus adult? Well, I'd love to show you a photograph, but I don't have one because we didn't find any. Extraordinary. This is the third commonest dragonfly we found in the forest in larvae, and we didn't find any adults. Now, I should put a word in here for ADDO, A -D -D -O, the African Dragonfly and Damselflies Online. It's a website produced by KD Dykstra, and if you want to know about African dragonflies, it's the place to go. Now, what Addo says about the genus Cornigonthus, it was long known from a damaged hollow type collected in mainland Equatorial Guinea in 1907. There are all sorts of other descriptions about it, but basically the summary is that the status of the genus and its two species then known require confirmation. But the distinctive structure of the appendages, etc., suggests that it's a, gen a valid genus. Well, it's certainly valid from a larval point of view, and it does kind of indicate the life cycle of some of these com these gomphids in the rainforests. The larvae are abundant; they feed abundantly. Then they emerge, disappear into the canopy, and you never see them again until the females come down to oviposit. And an awful lot of the females of Gomphidae are very hard to identify. Now, I can't leave you, I haven't mentioned anything much about Zygoptera, but I do need to tell you a little bit about one particular family, which is probably the most iconic family of damselflies in the, in the area, which is Pentaflebia, which is shown here. Now, the larvae, the, the adults are, well, they're quite interesting. They're, they're a little bit like our common red damselfly here, the large red damselfly, but about twice the size. Uh, but it's not the, the, the adults. By the way, the photograph, I, about the only decent photograph I ever got by arranging lights all around my camera, etc., etc. But it's the larvae that are much more interesting. And this is the larvae of Pentaflebia starlife found on Mount Coupe. It's adapted for rainforest streams. That is its, its habitat. It is a very flattened lifestyle. See, the legs are very flattened and the anal appendages have these strange uh, circe here, which again are flattened and tend to be used for sticking the insect to its, its fast flowing aquatic habitat. Um, uh, it's also this one, as you can possibly, I'll show you here, if you look in more detail at the appendages, underneath the appendages here, it's only, the only African drowned damselfly that still retains its gills. Um, now the interesting thing about this, it's unique, quite unique damselfly, you can't, there's nothing else like it in Africa, but if we look at it here, there is another genus which looks very similar, but is found only in South America, in the mountains and uplands of Venezuela, in very similar habitats. Uh, in fact, this specimen that are the, the, on the left is Pentaflebia, and on the right is a genus called Rimanella, which occurs, as I say, in Venezuela. In fact, uh, the, the specimen of Rimanella is from Graham Vick's collection, and he is the only person I know who's probably got both Rimanella and Pendaflebia in his collection. And the interesting thing about it, the, the theory is, well, the theory of these two very, very similar looking genera, although they are now known to be, from a DNA point of view, quite separate, it was thought that at one time it was one complete family that lived in uh, an area where both South America and Africa were joined. Um, as the two areas separated, so the two populations got separated. But because they live in very similar habitats, in very similar upland rainforest, which probably hasn't changed for millions of years, they have kept their same overall behaviour. So a few thoughts at the end of this talk. The man in the middle is Jacob. 
He was the patriarch, if you like, of the house in which we stayed for 1996 and 1998. And there he is, surrounded by his family, with us, the class of 1996, around him. I had long discussions with, with Jacob, who was of, of strongly of the view that Cameroon would be much richer when it has cut down its forests, just as you in the West have. And it's very hard to argue against that argument, uh, even though there are very persuasive arguments for keeping the forest, particularly in this part of Cameroon. One was, of course, the water catchments. All around Coupe, there are these sort of dam areas, which are incredibly useful for dragonflies and vital for the village. Um, because Philomachromia would live there, but the water was then channeled down and carried into the water taps. And the water taps were around the village, and from up past five in the morning onwards, those water taps were running. They provided the vital uh, source of water for the village. Without the forest, and this was a rather good little graphic done by the Mount Coupe Forest Project, on the left you can see how the water would fit, which filters normally out of the forest and comes down for the people, and how on the right, if you get rid of the forest, you basically have a gutter draining the water away, wiping out the soil and wiping out the humans. And you wonder this logic on the future of the forest. The, the, the Mount Coupe is situated in the land of the Bokossi tribe, and the Bokossi believe that their ancestors live in the forest, and this keeps commercial forestry in check. But will this situation prevail? Africa, the population pressures are enormous. This Africa is, is uh, projected to be the largest population growth of all continents. And one wonders whether or not Jacob's view will prove to be correct. And the paradise that is currently the forests of Cameroon will inevitably be lost. Thank you.